All right. Oh, sorry. So, uh, any discussion, anything you want to discuss, comments, really we love to hear from you. We love to hear from friends rather than enemies. So, we like to hear comments, uh, good or bad, from you. You are the users of these things. If you see any... Okay, oh, everyone is let, let me start with something that's a concern to me as a user. How are you going to deal with directivity models? Now, you all have directivity in your things. You can have large effects for a strike slip, and it's kind of averaged into your models. For reverse faults, the directivity is smaller, but it's always positive. How are you going to adjust your stuff so you don't double count that? that? OK. <laughs> From that model. Um, come tomorrow to the uh, Cosmos <laughs> meeting, and we'll answer that exact question for you. I can tell you that the, my plan is to, is to model directivity as an adjustment factor on sigma, where the standard deviation depends on the directivity or, or the geometry from the site and, and source. I think that's the easy way to do it without getting yourself into another huge calculation uh, issue. How about the other guys? The, the other guys. Bob, where is Brian? Brian? He's the directivity modeler also. Um, at least, uh, you know, after the fact, there was some directivity models developed by um, Batty and by uh, Spudi show uh, last time that got published but in the, in the proceedings, but they weren't available to us at the time. And at least, and I was, I've been following uh, Batty's work, and uh, he took the residuals from our 2008 model, which, by the way, had sediment depth in it, which you might think might trade off with directivity effects because they're both affecting long periods. And yet there were very strong trends in the residual versus uh, 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 directivity parameters. So granted, um, we'll look at those you know, basically, we'll look at these residuals and decide whether or not the direct it wants a directivity parameter. But it may actually just be what's left over, right? After other things like depth is is sucked up what it can. So, when these things are correlated, it's it's hard to separate the two unless you go strictly with theoretical type type results. Yeah, my response is very similar. Right now, um, I haven't talked to John in detail about this, but I don't think we're planning on incorporating the directivity model directly, and it would probably be incorporated the way Norm is talking about by uh, changing sigma, letting sigma have some dependence on the directivity parameters. Bob Young and Brian. Oh, sorry, you want to? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I keep an open mind about this, so we'll look at residuals, and uh, then we'll decide whether it makes sense to put in an extra term that complicates the model. Brian is the directivity modeler as well as GMP modeler, so he has two hats. Well, um, we're going to include it in our GMPE, and uh, we, we tried it last time. Uh, Paul and I have done a uh, modification model for the, to the GMPE, and um, we thought we're done, so, but, but when we ap applied our 2008 model, we find that uh, we are predicting amplification due to directivity effects almost everywhere around the fault. Okay, so that, that tells us that we are not centering our uh, formulation correctly. So, so one of the big push uh, for us this time is that, is that we want to make sure that we center our predictors correctly. Uh, so that, um, you know, regardless the GMP has a directivity in, in it or not, but at least when we apply it um, with the centering, we're not going to produce amplification all the time, most of the time. It's okay. So, so that is, that's the, um, the one thing that we, we learned in the hallway, uh, and hopefully this time we'll, you know, we'll get it done properly centered. Uh, how to center it is an issue that we have to work out because uh, it requires some computation. Okay. Uh, but I think what we're going to produce is, uh, is, is going to be usable. It's going to uh, make it more sense. Okay. Um, another thing um, that related to the centering is that uh, with the centering, then we incorporate that into our GMPE. That will force the GMPE regression 
to、uh, honor the fact that a site is actually on the forward directive direction. Like I don't know if you remember, Paul、uh, showed up、uh, example for the Imperial Valley earthquake is El Centro Array Station.、Um, at those station, the residuals from Ken's model are close to zero. That that means the media motion actually captured the directivity effect at those sites. Now with a with a proper centering. Of the directivity models, that will force the median to go below those El Centro array station sites. Okay, so that that will help tremendously. Okay,、um, and and that will get rid of a lot of the issue that you know a lot of people raise this afternoon about、uh, the old GMP has captured some of the directivity effect already. So this is our way of getting those directivity back. Okay, so. Force the median to, you know, to to be representing really the azimuthal average for a given distance at a given distance.、Um, and thirdly, I think with the with the centering, what it will help is that it will help actually improve the correlation between the ground motion and the predictors.、Uh, I have done some、uh, tests, and it, it shows that the, the slope、uh, between the The ground motion and the predictors actually increase by about 10 to 20 percent by simply just centering your predictor values. Okay, so、uh, so overall, I think we have a much better chance this time of making a huge improvement in how we model directivity and how we use it in applications. Bob. Uh, I just wanted to add to that that we will also, I think, look at、uh, creating a model that would capture the effect of directivity, but would not require a hazard analyst to loop over all of the、uh, all of the locations of directivity. So, in a sense, maybe if we can represent the, you know, go back and test and see if we can just put a, another sigma in with some parameters that will produce effectively the same result in hazard space. So the directivity will be there for specific applications, but that it,、uh, there will be a model that that could be used in hazard without requiring an extra loop in the in the hazard runs. Beyond all the other ones we'll put in. Okay. Yeah. So what Brian said and what the rest of us have said are actually completely consistent.、Um, you have to go through the step that Brian is talking about to center your models first of all. When we mean that, think of What he's saying: the the distribution of stations where we have recordings is not is not a uniform distribution for all future locations in earthquakes. It's biased by wherever we had the the station. So we have to get that model centered back to what it would look like if you had a uniform distribution of stations. And that's not a trivial task. Once you do that, then you can do this simplification pretty quickly and and make it implementable. But the model is now properly centered, and、um, Brian's going to do that for us, right? So, <laughs> so one thing that I mentioned in the next、uh, few weeks,、uh, Jenny Watson,、uh, who was here, and、uh, he went,、uh, she went to run these cases. She's working day and night. She's going to implement five directivity models into five GMPs, and、uh, I think by early December,、uh, she's going to show. The results to the group, and then we'll see really where we are. And next step is how we are going to go forward、uh, and do that.、Uh, she's working now on that one. Any other comments, questions? Yes,、uh, can you pass the mic, please? No, no, that mic you keep it. There is another.、Uh, in addition to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come on here. Yeah, yeah. We have room. <laughs> It's large auditorium. Yeah, exactly. That's fine.、Yeah. <laughs> Brian, come on. It's the lineup. All right. The question. Okay, so my question relates to、uh, the the effect or problem of of fling that that some records might possess in、uh, the in in the database, and just the question is. Has there been any effect, any any attempt to try Again, to recognize those records? Come tomorrow to the Cosmos <laughs> meeting. There's an hour-long discussion I, on that topic. I will be there. So, just for the sake of 
this this discussion about how the NGA uh, equations, the GMPs are. She's the best person to ask. Ronnie, that. come on here. Come on. She doesn't want to come. Uh, the, she's working on it. There is, uh, Ronnie has been digging into the issue of fling with some the simulated versus recorded motions and so on. But that is really a separate uh, task uh, uh, and it will be addressed in near future, near future. Tomorrow. Oh, will tomorrow. Be tomorrow, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, more comments. Roger, you had comments? This is just a comment, I guess, to follow on a little bit with respect to what Norm was just saying when he was just about to walk down the aisle, but having to do with the reference velocities. And I would just say that, uh, yeah, I, I think a key point here is basically the reference velocity probably as far as the equations are concerned should be chosen from a uh, science point of view or from the point of view of trying to capture all the nonlinearity in your model. Because this V sub S3760 has got a history that's kind of creeping in and taking over the science, I think, in some places in the sense that, first of all, when we were talking about the boundary between site class C and B originally, it was supposed to be 700 meters per second. It got rounded up to 750 meters per second because of the need to have it turn out to be a round number in British units. It had nothing to do with the science. And then since then, it's kind of moved up to 760, I think, in the code process somewhere. And so we're now kind of in a situation where we've got we're trying to implement a simplified process in the codes in which we have site classes and we have tabulated values assigned to those site classes and basically we have things set up so that uh, there's a reference site class with a unity factor and originally as it really set up everything was more or less consistent I think the 760 was initially chosen partly with respect to some pressures with respect to east coast versus west coast motions, and it was kind of in between. And uh, so uh, we now have the situation that basically uh, 760 is on a boundary, and so when we try to go from a continuous curve to a discrete curve, we basically are, have a value right strictly at the boundary, and the discrete process probably uh, is more consistent with the reference velocity being up somewhere in the midpoint of site class B. But in any case, this 760 value, I don't think it's got too much of a scientific basis, and basically the, probably the referen best reference velocity as far as equations is concerned is really a reference velocity that's dictated by where you have nonlinear, you want to capture all the nonlinear effects or some other effects, but... Um, anyway, 760's kind of got a history that's kind of evolved from a strange place. All right. Um, any other questions, comments from, yes, there is, uh, and also for the people on internet, please send emails to Christine. Uh, she's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So uh, uh, Bob mentioned that uh, he included the basin depth, then he didn't need to separate Northern California from Southern California. My question is for the other modelers, if, there was the, if the other modelers saw any uh, difference in the ground motion prediction of Northern California versus Southern California? We are not distinguishing between north and south at least. I north. did not look. No, so we, yeah. I don't know if you no. no I, I haven't looked either, but I, I will point out that, uh, you know, Bob Herman and his students have uh, looked at the broadband data, both from Southern California and Northern California, got remarkably similar attenuations, which, you know, there were some indications that maybe they should be different, but they were getting the same attenuation. So that actually is consistent now with, with Bob, what Bob is saying. So there's some people are interested. Those two papers, you know, have been published uh, in the BSSA, I think. 
So is that still out there? The question of why our signal is so high? I, someone, yeah, yeah, Dave uh, mentioned uh, a good point. I think someone asked about the uh, sigma of BSSA. I think by the, uh, we missed that. We missed it because we were coming here, uh, here to this stage. Yeah. Okay, well, just, just very quickly, uh, I'm pretty sure that's just because we have a constant sigma for all magnitudes. And when we look at the magnitude plot, it's clear that it, it gets smaller for the larger very magnitudes. Good. And that's what everybody else has talked about. So we're, we're going to be changing that. That's a good point. So it's not going to remain as different as it is. Right now, I mean, the, between the top and the bottom, the two that are fixed with magnitude they have huge differences. It's because most of the data is from the small magnitude. Yeah, actually, in, in the comparison plots that Nick was showing with the sigma as a function of magnitude, he started those magnitude plots at 5, I think, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And if he had continued into 3, you would have yeah. seen those, the magnitude-dependent ones, crossing our line. Yeah. And so... It's the same thing. Yeah, if you include yeah, the problem is if you don't if you don't do that, what's going to happen is their model is going to dominate the USGS hazard results yeah. because because the one with the biggest sigma wins. Right? Yeah. yeah absolutely. So absolutely. on the People question of running. sigma, Larry that Solomon is very had good a question point, uh, yeah. that Dave mentioned because Mark in the next few days uh, they are running these things before <laughs> running the yeah. maps. You guys have to fix the yeah, we sigma. Should, we should very good. Change point. our model and provide new information. In the next few okay. days. Okay. Very good. Question from the internet from Larry Solomon is how do the sigmas compare? to 2008 globally? Globally? Well, so I mean, the, as it model. impacts the hazard, you know. So let's go, to, oh, you, you're going to uh, uh, fix their sigma. <laughs> Norm, your sigma is up low, what uh, was bet to, between 2008 and? At the high magnitudes, it's pretty similar. So my, the uh, tau term actually went down a bit, uh, but you're dominated by the, the fee the, the within event term. And that's still about the same as, as what we had before. The main difference is when we ramp up to magnitude 3, we're right. way up to the point 0.9. That's true. Um, but that's not going to impact the hazard. No, no. no so but it, but the, it does impact your evaluation of sigmas from other areas where all you have is small magnitudes. Like the east. Like the east, <laughs> right. All extrapolate in the learning. Yeah, and so I think I mentioned in my talk right. as well, above 5.5, when we looked at the average, it's very similar to what we had, or, or maybe a little bit larger, but, but not significantly larger for those three periods that we've looked at already. So, um, and in fact, I think for one, it actually came down a little bit. A little. But, so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not, uh, fortunately, it's not, not, uh, not increasing not for the big It's drastically different. He asked me, uh, when was that, Thursday before we had the results? I said, not drastically different. I, think um, still I, I can just speak for Dr. Idris. His model is the same for Sigma, although he says that he will be revising it. So currently, what I had shown in the plots, it's the same as 2008. All right. Uh, for us, at the, we have similar value. I mean, we see similar values. We haven't changed the numbers from 2008 because we haven't done a detailed analysis. But we, in general amplitudes, are about the same at magnitudes 5 to 7. So. All right. Any other question? Please. Yeah, speaking as an implementer of these models, is there an effort or part or is part of the timeline in the next few months going to involve the development of a suite of test cases and verification tables that can be used to check whether Absolutely. Absolutely. We promise. I promise on behalf of everyone to march <laughs> uh, and so on. We are going to have tables Verification tables, otherwise you guys, Mark and others, there is a chance of making mistakes. We are going to have verification tables, for sure. Uh, any other questions, comments? Yes. Just, just to mention, we, we did provide, uh, and I granted it's not ideal, but at least in the deliverable we just gave to the USGS on Tuesday. <laughs> um, uh, we did provide, or at least we did, and I think others did provide either a uh, code, some Fort MATLAB code, Fortran code, or an Excel spreadsheet so that the uh, numbers could be checked. And, and it's not as easy as having a nice table, I agree, but we didn't have time to put that table again. But there is a, we did provide you with something to be able to uh, ch check, spot check some numbers anyway. So, Yes. 
Um, during the mad cow disease episode, one of the risk modelers stopped his presentation and commented that those who can't model are doomed to reality. What I wanted to ask is, with all this data now from magnitude 5 to 9 earthquakes, what, um, wouldn't a practitioner, why wouldn't they go to the data that the modelers are using? What, what problem are you solving by making these equations that couldn't be solved in practice by looking at the real data? Real data, what it's do you, easy, Jim? We're just giving them a, a convenient equation that represents the data. That's all we're doing. So instead of being given 19,000 data points and say, go do something with it, we present that and we simply parameterize it and say, these equations describe the center and the, the variability of the data. That, that's all that's going on. And then, Jim, as I mentioned, the data will be available anyway. And because there are lots of engineers and so on, they use the data for other purposes, to do structural analysis and other things. Obviously, available, but for the purpose of hazard analysis. In other words, because the data will be available, others will take that data and try to fit their own model exactly. to it. It's happened, and exactly. people have published models in the literature, so that will happen regardless of what we think, um, and others may think those models are better uh, than our models, that's fine. Uh, but the other thing for fitting a model is, you're all, uh, when you're doing in a forward prediction sense, you're not always within the nice bulk range of the data. You have to extrapolate the data, and these models give you a means of being able to, pre hopefully, if you believe us anyway, extrapolating the data in a meaningful manner. Can you guys talk a little bit about epistemic uncertainty? That is one task that as soon as uh, we have a stable yeah, model. Yeah, you need the models. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Linda is here. No, she just left. She for, just uh, left for, uh, yeah. for the baby. She has a two months uh, uh, old uh, baby. Linda and I and Bob Youngs will take care of her. So I can talk about what, what's going on with that. So uh, as a part of this uh, Overall, overall project, we will be developing a, a proposed epistemic uncertainty model and how to uh, add whatever we consider to be an appropriate additional epistemic uncertainty to the basically something beyond just using the five models. And the process that we're using for doing that is to look at each of the models and see how well those models are constrained by the data and provide a, a, a quantification of the, how well those models are constrained individually and we will factor that into a, an estimate of a, an additional epistemic uncertainty that could be considered for adding to those models for running in, for a, capturing epistemic uncertainty in the hazard analysis. So uh, Linda and I have our task with doing an initial estimate of that model, and it will be presented to to the uh, developers and for for a vote on. January 30th. 30th. No, the, uh, I think Bob, uh, uh, yeah, the essence, Bob uh, said that we are going to have one uh, collective uh, directivity model from the NGA group, not epistemic, epistemic sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, epistemic for the yeah, whole uh, NGA group. All right, anything else? Yes, Sifa. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question you know, following uh, Ken's comment. Um, I actually come from the, uh, practice in the industry practice. Um, so we're actually very much interested in the forward prediction um, of, of this equation. So I just want to ask if, have you actually tried to use, let's say, in a magnitude up to 7.0 and develop the equations and try to test how your equations, you know, are calibrated against magnitude 8.0 or or 7.5 events. Have, have you actually tried to test those? Did I make oh. I would say no, and the reason no is that you have so few data, you're going to then be at, the, at the, the mercy of, you know, if I built a model that predicts a stochastic process, and now I go take two samples from that stochastic process, that doesn't check the model. To check it, I need to be getting a large number. And where we're going to be able to, to look at the predictive power later on 
is when you start to get numerical simulations that you also can use, and if those are extrapolating in a similar way, we'll have more confidence in it. But at this point, we can't, uh, there's really not enough data up there, I think, to do, to do a, a test. So if it worked, it wouldn't tell me it's right, and if it, if it was wrong, it wouldn't tell me it was, if it didn't match, I wouldn't say I throw out my model. Yeah, and for example, right now, uh, like we, we mentioned, we're all seeing oversaturation in our model, but we're not allowing it because there's just a handful of big magnitude earthquakes that are doing that. So if we were to take, say, the Chi Chi earthquake and compare it to our prediction, uh, f for high frequencies, we're going we're gonna to over-predict, and that's because we've made a modeling decision not to allow oversaturation. So that just kind of fits in with what, what Norm said, until we have some more data or the simulations, as he mentioned earlier, that support so that there's a physical understanding of why there's saturation. We can all hypothesize. We all have our, <laughs> every one of us can come up for a, di for a different reason why that it might be the case. But until the, the simulations that are based on the more physics-based approach uh, can demonstrate that that actually occurs. Um, right now it's difficult because the simulations actually use a stochastic model at high frequencies. So basically they're, no, you know, they're really no different than the empirical data. And so somehow they have to, and I know they're working on it, they need to, have to figure out how to push those models to higher frequencies so we can really rely on, on them. All right. More comments, questions? Yes, from the implementation point. <laughs> yeah, there are two topics um, that have come up in the past, and one just, one just very recently. So just getting back to the epistemic uncertainty, I think from the survey perspective, it would be nice to have you, this group, think and then perhaps provide some input and advice on the actual application of any epistemic uncertainty model that gets developed in as much as the hazard model, the earthquake rupture forecast used by the survey, already takes into account both epistemic and aleatory uncertainty on the magnitudes, and does that end up having sort of a double counting effect if you're applying that uncertainty again, uncertainty again on the ground motions after the fact? The second uh, point is that, as I'm sure you all are aware, USERF 3 involves a much more complex set of finite fault ruptures and earthquake sources, and this the the subject of multi-fault ruptures came up in a, some very preliminary workshop uh, over a year ago, um, and it was it was left that we would basically defer to you as developers as to what to do in a scenario where there's a rupture that is has started on a strike-slip fault and then jumped to a reverse fault, and how you would then characterize those complex ruptures in the context of these equations. I'm glad they, they left it to us to resolve this. <laughs> this is going to be, Dave has a very good suggestion. In NGOS 5, we are going to address that. <laughs> it, I think at this point, it mostly just, you know, a, a sort of a, 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 simplif a simplifying model or just some guidance. I, I think we can come up with a solution on how to address those complex ruptures, but I think it should take input f both on this, the USGS, the USERF 3 side, and the, so, the bottle uh, developers. So, Brian, side. maybe you're going to just, Brian was part of the team that they assigned uh, fault mechanism or deep and so on on the multi-segments. What was the process you went through to assign one uh, uh, number, for example, for deep angle or for fault mechanism in the flat file? So can you pass the uh, thing? Yeah. So um, we basically take the entire fault. Uh, and depends on what parameters we're interested in, we have slightly different approach. For example, if it's the closest distance, of course we'll take the, the closest distance of, to the multi-faults. Multi um, and for deep angle, I don't think uh, in the flat file, if there is multi-fault, um, I think what we, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I, two things come to my mind. One is that we, at one point, we just used the deep angle from the uh, moment tensor solution. Okay. Um, and if there is a um, multi-fault model, what we do is we usually take the weighted average of the deep angles. Okay. 
Um, because at that point, we don't envision deep angle become a major ground motion predictor. So, uh, so we didn't uh, think it's a, you know, it's something that worth, you know, elaborate on. So, um, for for our ISO for directivity parameters depends on what parameter. I mean, for depends on which predictors you're talking about. We have different way of putting things together. Uh, for the isochrome predictors, um, Paul and I decided that we're just going to take the maximum predictor values among the multifolds. Okay. Now for uh, things like uh, summer values, 97 predictors, uh, it's because the definition is relatively simple. What we can do is you can, we can just paste them together. Okay. So we'll there is a, um, so we'll calculate um, the, the rupture length on one fault and the rupture length on the other fault, and we add them together, okay, and call that the total rupture length, I mean, length toward the site. Okay. Um, and I think pretty much that's, that, that's it. So, How about um, rake? Because hmm? rake? Rake, um, that would determine the mechanism. Right, the rake is again like dip angles. Okay, we would use the moment tensor solution because it's represent the overall uh, style faulting or the rake angles. Um, and if there's a multi this multiple fault, um, I don't remember what we did. I think uh, for Wen Chuan, I, I think we need to ask him or what we Bob did Darrow. for Wen Chuan. Bob Darrow? Not what we did with the rake, which Greg did. We should we check that out because that's, that's a possible rule we could give to the USPS and they can apply the same thing to them. Tim probably. Tim is the one who. Tim, is, are you checking? <laughs> Tim is checking. <laughs> Tim is. Oh, he's behind the podium for me. All right. While Tim is uh, checking uh, specifically uh, what they did, uh, is there any other comments or questions? Yes, Paul is footage. Well, I'll oh, also sorry, sorry. You had a question about double counting of evaluatory variability. Uh, if, if you're doing numerical simulations, yes, that would be an issue. In our ground motion models, I don't think there is any significant, or probably any at all, but uh, we don't see uh, a high correlation of a static stress drop with our event residuals. And we'll tr check it again, but I've, we've never been able to, to find something that works in the empirical models. Simulations would be a completely different case. So I don't, I don't think there's any uh, problem with combining that variability with the uh, ground motion term. I just want to make a comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, yeah Just please. to follow up, I think oh. he was talking about epistemic uncertainty, because yeah. the USERF model has very extensive epistemic uncertainties on, on various things, and I think he was wondering if we also produce an epistemic uncertainty model on the ground motion models. Is that double counting? And I don't know. Have you thought of that? Uh, I haven't really thought of it, but I, at first I don't think it would be uh, double counting, because all our predictions are given that you know the magnitude. And given that you know the distance, this is what the ground, we're, we're giving the uns, epistemic uncertainty in the prediction of the ground motions, given you know magnitude and distance and all the other parameters. And then some of those are aleatory, some of those may be epistemic in your model, but in terms of it's our predictions are all conditional on you knowing those things. Paul. Yes, uh, just a comment on this issue of, of how to handle the geometry of complicated faults. Uh, and now, this is more critical for the directivity models than for your GMBEs, but it might be worth giving some thought to the, issuing some guidelines about just how accurately one has to define a fault in order to get a useful result out of these relationships. Uh, because some of our fault models are very detailed, and um, for directivity, they make the calculation sometimes rather unstable. And you know, it, it just might be good to have some guidelines about just how accurately you need to represent a fault. All right. Okay. Any other uh, comments, uh, questions? Jim. There's no more time, is 
So, um, since you're releasing your flat file on the 101st anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, I wanted to bring up the issue of public safety. Um, one of the... Um, I didn't know that really, but that's great to know. <laughs> so we should sh uh, change the date. <laughs> well, um, the move to NGA uh, prediction equations wasn't a totally consensus idea in the true sense that it's something everybody agreed to and it was opposed at some of the workshops. And, but what it created was um, not problems in California, which basically does deterministic design because they're so close to active faults that the uh, PSHA blows up and they have to cap it, but it reduced the basically design strength and also the design parameters by 25 to 30 percent. It reduced them 30 percent in central Virginia over a period of 10 years, and then they had this earthquake which had intensities that Neherp said um, would be expected in seismic design categories C and D. And then in the West Coast, in Oregon, the latest A is CE7 reduced the design strength by 30% for our part of the subduction zone, but not for Washington's. And despite the fact that we've had four magnitude nine subduction zone earthquakes in the last eight years. So there's a... Uh, Basically, the, the code says do this to achieve this strength, and when people just plug in uh, ground motion values, the code really doesn't design for ground motion, and nobody's protecting the, the floor. This came up at a SMIP meeting when somebody said, look, we tested all these building periods, and they're a lot shorter than the code gives us, and Anil Chopra stood up and he said, yeah, we, we knew that, we put that in the code, so people wouldn't be extending the period and designing for too low a force. So we've kind of lost track of what should be the floor. So, and Jonathan mentioned these, uh, site class E has been the biggest fear and it's said you have to do a site specific investigation and all this and it came out of Mexico City and if we reduce those by 50% or whatever, it just, um, I just want to bring up this. There's a real problem with stability because it affects what's a dangerous building, what's an earthquake prone building. If your hazard suddenly goes down, but you still have these dangerous buildings, and then you get a real earthquake, it's just somebody needs to bite the bullet and address these issues of stability, I think. Jim, I think your question is a really important one, but really it's not uh, in our scope to address. You <coughs> just mentioned almost entire earthquake engineering, not only the hazard part, all the way to getting to the period of structures and stability. So it's very important, but really we have to work with the other groups in the community to address complicated uh, process from the hazard to solid structure interaction, a structural response, linear, nonlinear, and then stability. Um, uh, we, it's really an issue that we have not even uh, thought about. It. It's out of our scope. But it's important, no question about it. Um, any other questions, comments from online, offline? Oh, okay. We have only a few more minutes um, as a user's, uh, uh, user of these formulas, um, on the hanging wall effect, when you're dealing with the buried fault, is, is Rx of zero um, at the projection, the surface projection of a buried fault, is that true or should it move towards the foot wall side because of the, the wave propagation or... Uh, or something like that. I, I'm, it's hard to hard to ask the question without drawing pictures. But. Uh, I think Brian has a figure in his paper, 2008. Or is that right, Brian? 
Yeah. Well, the, the, the last presentation that, that did the examples, yes. he showed the buried fault and the RX of zero right. at service protection of the buried fault for the hanging wall yes. effect. Uh, but is, is the, the hanging wall effect somewhat trapping the waves because there's a fault plane there you know, in the surface? Or, and do we lose that when we have a buried fault and so, so that moves over? No. 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 No? Okay. The hanging wall is, is primarily geometry. Yeah. The fact that you're sitting above the projection of the rupture plane, it seems to be primarily a geometric effect. Okay. The other part, if you're up dip from a very fall, then that would be more of a directivity issue, which would appear more in low frequency than in high frequency. Right. So up dip actually following the, the fault actually plane up dip? the projection dip. of the fault to the, up towards the ground surface, that would be in the forward directivity, perhaps uh -huh. for... A, a buried rupture going up dip. Okay. Which is why the hanging wall effect disappears at long periods, right? This right. Is because it's being counteracted by directivity. Right. So um, the way Nick did it is the right way to is that the right model. Okay. Thanks. All right. Other questions, comments? Yes, buddy. Let me turn it off. Uh, I want to go back to the double counting of epistemic uncertainty. Uh, based on what you said, given M, you compute ground motions, and, uh, but there is one, another step there that, you know, one thing about in the user, they have a lot of epistemic uncertainty in magnitude area relations. They have many branches. Now, in the NGA, you compute dimension, you know, you, you, in a way, you compute fault geometry and dimensions and go from M to the geometry and then based on that. So I'm wondering still, we, we might have some double count. No, we have, a, we have an estimate. I mean, we actually have from inversion for the large events where the rupture actually was. So, that's the, so we, based on that inversion, we believe we know where the rupture was. So even uh, determining the finite fault from the magnitude of... No, is not we do not do that. that we, on the, for the small events, we do, we do simulate area relationships for the small events to remove the bias of the fact that hypocenter distance is biased estimate of the closest distance. But that's only applied to events typically below five and a half or six where the differences are small and we're just removing that small dip bias. But for big events where, where this issue will be really important, we are basing it on actual estimates of where the ruptures actually were. Okay. Just to try to, why we know or don't think this is a big effect, if you run hazard, and in your hazard calculation you put in aleatory variability in your magnitude, in the area of your rupture for a given magnitude, it has almost no impact on the computed hazard. What these guys, USERF will do is produce a rate of earthquakes of a given magnitude and a location. You could think about their, their having different stress drops, essentially, on those events. It's changing the distance distribution a little bit, but it's really a small effect. That's why I don't know what these other guys do on hazard. I quickly turn off that, that aleatory variability on the rupture area because it's not worth it, and it adds another factor of you know, five into the, into the run time. So we, I think we have pretty good evidence or, or, or an experience to know that is not a significant uh, area of double counting. Oh, by the way, that was one of the topics that when we put together the interaction meeting between NGA West 2 and USERF 3, we were, you know, we were supposed to interact yeah, we discussed and find it. the answer. Yeah, yeah, but there was the same thing. But yeah, exactly. But is, a, uh, we discussed it with uh, USERF group. Also. I think there's a paper that was published by Bernice Bender in 1984 yeah. or 5 that basically showed that Putting in the aleatory variability in the rupture area versus using the mean area produces essentially the same hazard. So I just run a relationship that gives me the mean area given a magnitude. Is there anyone out there who, who, who randomizes the rupture area for a given magnitude in their hazard calculation? Zero? See, no, the fine. answer is no. <laughs> All right. No. Any, <laughs> any other comments, questions? No, no, uh, from, very good.
So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you for coming here. And we are going to have USC, not we, USCS will have a workshop on December 12 and 13, right? In International House, they are going to show the results of uh, the implementation of new GMPs. Thanks a lot. And, and if you want to learn more about implementation Brian. of directivity and fleeing, come to the Cosmos meeting tomorrow. Very good. Cosmos meeting location. I don't know. Oh, no, no. Hotel in Emeryville. Uh, the Hilton Garden Inn in Emory. Exactly, exactly. Very good. You guys wait here. Very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, everyone. Wow, so many people worked on this project. Thank you very much.